last weekend at Trailhead, we began a new summer message series reflecting upon a few of the parables Christ shared during his earthly ministry. Beginning last weekend with the parable of the sower. And had you been able to join with us in worship last week, you may recall how we were afforded a special opportunity in that Jesus Christ not only provided to us the parable, but on that occasion, the scriptures also offer to us his own personal explanation of the parable as well. This week, and in the weeks to follow, we may not be as fortunate to have an absolute concrete interpretation provided for us within the biblical text, or furthermore, one that came directly from Christ's own lips. But using some careful wisdom and thoughtful consideration of the context within which each parable is originally given, in combination with the further teachings afforded to us by Christ in the Gospels, we'll aim to collectively seek to identify the intended meaning of some of these, at times, puzzling parables. All parables demand interpretation, as they inevitably serve to point the listener or reader towards something more than what is being shared on the surface. As noted last week, parables are not merely stories designed to entertain, but were offered by Jesus in an effort to teach or present a particular principle or lesson. Most of Christ's parables stand independently on their own, and they don't necessarily require any previous spiritual knowledge either. Most parables in Scripture are direct and concise, which each of them almost always including some sort of a twist, surprise element, or reversal of expectation. And today's parable fits nicely into just such a pattern. But before we turn our attention today to Jesus' parable of the friend at midnight, let's open up this time of study of God's Word together in prayer. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, as we do each week, for your written Word, that you have preserved for us your message to your people within the text of the Bible. And Lord, as we explore this parable today, might we be able to understand what you are trying to share with us so that we might apply its wise teaching into our lives. So Lord, may you guide us in our view of the text. May the Holy Spirit be here to help interpret your meaning that would allow for our understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
look back There's no one else for me No one else for me I won't look back I won't look back There's no one else for me No one else for me I won't look back I won't look back There's no one else for me No one else for me I won't look back I won't look back I will arise and go to Jesus Might I invite you to turn in your Bibles now to Luke chapter 11, a passage of scripture which contains a parable that many watching online today may already be familiar with, and one that I believe shouldn't prove to be too difficult for us to decipher together this morning either. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And Jesus said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now there's a lot to chew on here in this weekend's passage. But let's begin by first looking at the conditions under which this parable was initially offered, as it's helpfully laid out for us quite bluntly in verse 1, where it says, One day Jesus was praying, and when he finished praying, one of his disciples asked him to personally teach the group how to pray. Disregarding anything else for a moment, just with the reading of verse 1, we should already have a pretty good head start in the proper direction of where this teaching is going to be headed. Jesus has just himself personally completed praying and one of his disciples asked him to instruct the group how to pray. So what might you expect that Jesus is going to follow with? Is he going to cryptically offer ways in which one can pursue holiness? Is he going to take it upon himself to at this time teach on the majesty and glory of God or speak of the approach of the kingdom of heaven? 
Now, while some of these themes may arise in the parable or in the teaching surrounding it, the ultimate purpose behind today's parable should be understood to be concerning Christ answering the disciples' question, how we ought to pray. So to begin, Christ initially offers to his disciples what we've come to call the Lord's Prayer, offering it to them as a model for prayer. And how ought the disciples to pray? Look at verse 2. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. How ought you to pray? Jesus is basically saying, look, I'll go you one further. Instead of just how, here's what you should even say. That said, however, please understand that Christ presents these words as a model for prayer. And the prayer Christ offers here shouldn't be considered to be the only acceptable prayer or method of prayer that can be offered to God. But that said, however, the Lord's Prayer does contain a number of themes and elements that do make it a good model and example for prayer. It speaks to God's holiness and how his name is to be honored and revered. It speaks to God's provision, providing the daily bread, and his heart of forgiveness for us, we who need to be forgiven. And it also expresses how we ought to desire to likewise share a heart of forgiveness too, adopting a grace-filled attitude in the hopes to prevent allowing any animosity between us and others, interfere with or stain our own relationship with God the Father. And lastly, this prayer asks for God's guidance to protect us from the personal temptation to do and commit evil, sinful acts. It's a whole lot of content contained in just a few short lines. But that said, this is really just the preamble of the parable. While initially asked by his disciples to be taught how to pray, Jesus not only offers the words they ought to use as a model for prayer, but after he shares with them the Lord's Prayer, Jesus then offers to them the attitude with which they ought to adopt when they pray such words as well. And here's where the parable makes its appearance in today's passage. As you return back to the text once more in verse 5, And Jesus said to them, his disciples, Which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Within early Palestinian communities, there are a number of built-in cultural and social expectations the local citizens gladly adopted. Perhaps the first and foremost amongst them being that they do their very best to help a neighbor whenever they were in need. One might not even just consider it an expectation so much as almost an obligation or mandatory requirement. So integral was this commonly understood principle within village life that Jesus doesn't even need to appear to accept, uh, to, to explain or comment on the situation as his audience, the disciples, would have immediately recognized and understood the neighbor's obligation to aid in his friend's request. In Poet and Peasant, a study on the parables found within the Gospel of Luke, K.E. Bailey offers that the honor of the very village was at stake here within such a situation. And no self-respecting villager will let his friend and thus the entire village down by refusing a simple request for bread regardless of the hour. Whenever a guest arrived upon a person's doorstep, there were certain expectations that fell upon the owner of the home, whether the guests were expected or not. Even if the guest arrived at three o'clock in the morning, the host was still responsible for setting out a resplendent meal for their traveling guests to feed upon after their arrival, fully expecting that their guest travels would have caused them to be tired and hungry. 
Such a welcoming, expressing open hospitality to the traveler pretty much on behalf of the whole community. So when this parable was originally given, the question asked by Christ could be considered largely rhetorical by in nature. You know, Suppose one of you has a friend in your neighborhood to whom he goes to for help. Right? Disciples would have easily filled in the blanks on their own. Well, of course, you'd get out of bed and help your brother in need. It would be an honor and a, and a privilege to help a friend out, far be it from an annoyance. Particularly when helping out a friend who was hosting someone in their home and just arrived there after a long journey, the reputation... An honor of our family, our entire community is at stake. We have to act in such a way that our good reputation of hospitality would travel with them back home or anywhere else these guests travel. Both my mother and my father were raised in the Maritimes, more specifically in Yarmouth County on the southwestern tip of the province of Nova Scotia. I spent several of my summers as an adolescent and teen taking turns staying with both sets of my grandparents while my parents and siblings remained home in Ontario. I also had an elderly aunt from Massachusetts who summered at a cottage up there with no telephone service. And it gave the family a greater sense of security knowing there was an able-bodied young Tim around to look out for her. Not that I was all that resourceful, mind you. Although keeping the cottage free of spiders and carrying in the groceries were well within my wheelhouse. At least I had two legs and I could run to a neighbor if any type of actual help was needed. And I know that there are several here in our church community who also grew up or spent time, some time in military bases in either Nova Scotia or New Brunswick. And they're already more than familiar with what's been known as the East Coast Lifestyle. And even now, you probably have a pretty good sense of where I'm heading. One set of my grandparents lived in a refurbished mobile home, one that had been expanded upon and expanded upon and expanded upon some more. But within my grandmother's daily routine, sometime in the early afternoon, she'd begin to prepare a full-blown feast. Even though there was just me and my grandpa and herself, She still insisted on preparing a full dinner that could feed upwards of six or eight people. Because you just never know when someone is going to stop by around dinner time. And it would have been an absolute travesty had she not prepared enough food to feed her guests. Now, we, we had some regulars, friends and neighbors or distant cousins who would conveniently darken the doorstep around 4.45 in the afternoon. And no matter how many meals they'd already joined us with that week, they were always welcome. And if nobody stopped by that night, we just had ample leftovers for the following day's lunch. Although I can't help but mention that some would come by and they would say, what's for dinner? And my grandma might say, well, we're having pork chops. And they say, nope, I had pork last night. And often the next house they went seeking out another menu option. Now, my grandmother would have been completely ashamed and embarrassed had someone ever stopped by and her cabinet had been bare. And that same principle is present within this parable as well. In early Palestine, traveling friends were to be openly welcomed into the home and that household's hospitality extended beyond the walls of their own home and stretched out to include the entire village and community as well. Jesus speaks of a situation here in this parable where a home is visited upon by a traveling friend and upon his late night arrival, the host of the home embarrassingly has absolutely nothing from within his pantry to feed his guests with. So rather than send his traveling friend to bed hungry without any food or sustenance, an act that would have brought shame upon both himself and the entire community, he did what any self-respecting citizen of that town would do. He went out of the home to ask for assistance. And how does he address the person he approaches for help in verse 5? He says, friend, lend me three loaves. He doesn't approach the rich guy down the street whom he knows has a stock cupboard. It doesn't even say that he approaches his immediate neighbor either, or someone who is conveniently nearby. But rather the homeowner approaches someone he refers to as a friend. Someone he already has a close relationship with, a a chum 
whom he figured he could count on to help him out even at this late hour. Well, at least that's what you'd think. And that's what the disciples expected too, but no. This so-called friend actually refuses to lend his buddy a hand. And here's the parable's unexpected twist that we mentioned earlier. As all of the disciples in attendance would have been shocked to hear that this friend refused coming to the aid of this man with an empty pantry. And if that's not shocking enough, this friend actually attempts to justify his refusal to lend his buddy bread by responding at first, don't bother me. The friend is essentially labeling his brother in need a nuisance, a bother. Go away, he says. Quit your pestering me. Come back tomorrow. And then he offers, well, the door's shut. I already locked the door. I can't even invite you to come in and get the bread yourself, even if I wanted to. And more on this locked door in a moment. Third, he says, the, the family's in bed. Haven't you looked at the time? Everyone is in bed. My wife, my children, everyone. If I get up now, I'm just going to wake everybody up. Please don't disturb my family's comfort and slumber. Although I might mention that I did add that please in there myself. Must be the Canadian in me. And lastly, the man offers, I cannot get up. And this final excuse goes beyond him even not wanting to get up. But he actually claims instead that he can't get up implying that the friend is basically demanding of him the impossible. And to add further insult to injury, the friend is probably not even knocking at the door to the house proper. When the homeowner claimed that his door was shut, he was probably referring to the home's outer gate. Early Palestinian homes, and still many homes within African towns and cities today, traditionally had gates or exterior walls surrounding the front of their home. And this friend was probably most likely out on the street calling out loudly to his buddy inside the home in full earshot of all of the surrounding neighbors too. Further adding to the community's collective embarrassment and shame with the neighbors probably hearing both sides of this conversation. Now let's pause for a second to imagine that we were in the disciples' shoes for a moment hearing this parable for the very first time. What is it again that Jesus was trying to teach them here? What is it that God's word, the scriptures, are trying to communicate to us? Is Jesus suggesting that God is an old grump, hesitant to get out of bed and help those in need, but that he'll inevitably give in if we pester him enough? We get into trouble when we attempt to make the parable into something that it is not. At the very beginning of this morning's message, we concluded that the root purpose of this parable is to instruct the disciples in how they ought to pray. As followers of Jesus Christ, we know that God possesses the power to answer our prayers, yet several of us hesitate. We say we don't want to inconvenience God. We fear bothering him with what we consider to be petty, small things in our life. Yet these are still things that cause us undue stress, that cause us worry, that cause us concern. And the bottom line is, if it's of concern to us, it likewise concerns our God who both cares for and desires the best for us at all times, in all circumstances, regardless of the time of day. The disciples would have been shocked and appalled at the homeowner's initial refusal to help his friend in need. An attitude that Jesus and anyone from that particular culture and tradition would have been aware of and shared. But due to the friend's refusal to give up and his continued boldness and persistence in continuing to ask his friend for for help from outside on the street, we're told the once reluctant friend would in fact eventually give in and answer his friend's need. In verse 8, I tell you though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, 
if his son asks for a fish, well, instead of a fish, give him a serpent. Or if he asks for an egg, well, give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? So, to paraphrase here or sum it up, if a homeowner, someone who is just a friend, will relent and aid another friend in need, how much more so will God help us? We who are not just a friend, but one that God loves, those he considers his very own children. Christ offers here at the end of the parable a number of examples of how a loving parent would never desire to intentionally deceive or harm their child. And then he concludes this teaching with the question, and I'm paraphrasing here, if this grumpy Gus, who initially didn't want to get out of bed and will still give up and give a friend to ask for bread due to his tenacity, if a father who possesses a heart of sin, one that consistently does evil, will still go out of their way to give good gifts to their children, then how much more will your Father in heaven give you even greater things? most notably the glorious and incredible gift of the Holy Spirit himself. When Jesus Christ first shared this parable with his disciples, they would have thought it unthinkable that the homeowner would ever refuse to aid a friend in need of bread, regardless of the hour. And in a like fashion, it should be virtually impossible to think that God would ever turn his back on his children either. And that is why he has offered to us not just a quick fix, or a temporary band-aid to our problem of sin. But due to his overwhelming love and grace, God offers to us the permanent assistance of the Holy Spirit to ever aid us, not just in our hunger, but in our lifelong daily human struggles. Now, does that mean that God will always give us what we ask for? No. He won't give us things that contradict his will and character. He won't give us things that will blow up or boost our own ego or our own sense of pride, our own sense of entitlement. That God will work and he will act in accordance to his holy and righteous will. Whenever we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, all those who believe in the saving work of Jesus Christ become empowered with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Never again are we left alone without the power of and without the power of the Spirit working in and through us in all areas of the corners of our lives, in our jobs, in our families, in our relationship with others, and perhaps most fittingly within today's parables, the, the Spirit is active within our prayers. And the most amazing thing is that God's response doesn't just address a temporary physical need. He graciously addresses our eternal spiritual need as well by his blessing us with the everlasting gift of the Holy Spirit. Because once again, we need to remember the purpose behind Jesus' sharing of this parable. And it's not to clarify the compassionate heart of God. But rather, Jesus shared this parable in response to the disciples' question, how ought we to pray? And what does this parable inevitably show us? I believe it resoundingly expresses God's desire for us to be unrelentingly persistent with our prayers, with our requests. Personally adopting the attitude that nothing is too big nor too small for God to hear and answer. One might even consider that to give up on prayer could be considered to be giving up on God. But rather this man remained out on the street and continued to ask his friend for help as we too ought to ever seek to pray with great boldness and persistence, entirely confident of God's even greater love for his children. sinfully my heart was dark my eyes 
sublime to see my pride destroying me but your life set for sin to die and your blood shed to justify upon the cross my ransom to afford this sinner's great reward thank you jesus for the cross thank you for the price you paid for us giving up your life to save the lost thank you jesus for the cross the crown placed upon your head the nails made for me instead your death became the only way to life to me to live is christ thank you jesus for the cross thank you for the price you paid for us giving up your life to save we believe that God desires the best for us and that he possesses an overwhelming desire to help and care for his children, why wouldn't we feel open to bringing whatever troubles, woes, and needs we have before him in our prayer? We have everything to gain and nothing to lose, except maybe our own selfish sense of pride and stubbornness. Because of the persistence of this man who sought bread from a friend, for a visiting house guest. His willingness to potentially embarrass himself by crying out to his friend from the street. The man's needs were answered. The ultimate purpose of this week's parable is not to encourage us to be generous with what we have, but rather the rich lesson to keep and treasure from within the parable of the friend at midnight is that anything a person can possibly give is as nothing compared to what God has to offer to us all. And yet all we have to do to receive this gift is but ask. Would you please pray with me today that we would develop an attitude of prayer that lays aside our pride and humbly brings our requests to God confident 
in the Lord's power to address any and all of our immediate and future needs? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this parable from Scripture. And Lord, I know that many people take different aspects and things from this parable. But Lord, really the ultimate root of what Jesus, why Jesus shared it is because he was trying to share the attitude with which we should pray. And that attitude involves when we need help, that we ask for it. That we set aside our own pride and be humble in pleading with another who can help us. And Lord, no one can help us better than you. So Lord, when we do have needs, when we are desperate, when we're low, Lord, may we not wallow amongst ourselves. But Lord, may we approach you, the God who is sovereign over all things, a God who cares for and loves his children, a God who is concerned for us and wants to care for us, even at times, Lord, when we don't think we deserve it. Lord, may we commit to being a person of prayer, May we commit to approaching you with the big or small things, knowing that you are loving, knowing that you hear us. And even though we might ask a friend for help, how much more will our Father in heaven seek to reach out and help his children? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next week, as we return to our summer study of the parables, We'll be reviewing Christ's parable of the ten bridesmaids because it just wouldn't be summer without an extravagant wedding. Until next time, God bless and bye for now.